Hello, my name is Brendan Cleveland, and this is Curveflow. In this presentation, I'm going to go in depth to a problem I found with difficulty in games and my solution to fix it. I'll go over a full game I built to demonstrate my solution and then finally talk about what I learned. But first, I need to explain flow. Zen Rhino defines flow as the area between these two lines on a graph of difficulty and player skill. Flow travels along a wave between these, providing moments of high and low tension to keep a player engaged. However, if difficulty breaks out of these lines, a player will lose interest in their game. If a challenge is too difficult and chance of success is impossible, or if a challenge is too easy and chance of failure is impossible, the player is no longer interested in your game. So how do we fix this? Many games like to implement a difficulty selection screen, such as this one. The problem with this is that if a player has not played the game yet, they don't know what difficulty works best for them. And furthermore, many games such as Wolfenstein here will mock the player for choosing an easier difficulty, which will lead them to choose harder ones than they should have. A better solution, then, is dynamic difficulty, where a game will automatically adapt itself as you play. Resident Evil, for example, in this room, there's two crosswomen marked in the back that you can't see very well with this color, but if you're not a high enough skilled player, they actually just won't show up. And this can even happen if you die too many times in this room as you're playing. But there's an issue with doing difficulty like this. It, what if you were to enter this room and die a couple times, not because of the guys in the back, but because of the ones rushing you? In that case, removing the crossbowmen would not change how you play the game. The issue with dynamic difficulty is that, is that it assumes all players struggle with the same things. So how do we fix this issue? My solution is dynamic difficulty with multiple variables. So instead of doing this, we might have something that looks more like that. And this is where my capstone, Curveflow, comes in. It's an API designed to solve this issue by offering developers as many dimensions of difficulty tracking as they want. It's fully customizable by the developer to choose how it tracks its data and what it can do with that data. By using what I call a query file, the developer of the game can define tables of data that Curveflow will go through and choose the optimal one for each individual situation. Through these, it's able to automatically maintain tension and flow by providing moments of high and low skill on the player's specific strengths and weaknesses. The issue with curve flow, however, is that it is not very easy to present. Using it directly, all you get is this console stuff up here. So instead, I decided to develop an entire game alongside of it to fully show off what it's capable of. And we'll get more into that game in a little bit. But first, I do want to talk about the technology. It's mostly split between Curveflow and the demo game itself. The demo was written in Unity with C Sharp, with the majority of the assets being created myself in Blender. Curveflow, however, was written entirely in C Sharp, but with a documentation and tutorial fully written in Sphinx and hosted through Read the Docs. What I didn't realize when I started this project is that documentation languages are a standalone thing. Sphinx is a Python-based compiler that takes simple text files and parses them into fully like documented HTML that cross-references itself. If you mention a name of a function in one file, you can click it and it'll jump to another page and where on that page that function is stored. Read the Docs is a documentation hosting site for open source projects where it will take HTML stored inside of your project's Git repository and automatically make an interface for browsing through it. With these two combined, I was able to make a fully fledged documentation that looks fairly professional, and the same thing that Python and Godot's documentation run on. So this is FlowQuest, the game I developed alongside of this whole system. It's a top-down shooter where you play as a wizard trying to get out of a dungeon. For simplicity's sake, I only decided to use two difficulty tracking variables, which is the grab skill and the dodge skill listed down there. And I'll get more into detail on what exactly curve flow controls on it later on. But first, I just want like to show some basic video of playing the game. It functions like your standard top-down shooter. You can move around, fire attacks, you've got mana, stuff like that. But overall, the gameplay itself is not too fancy. It's more of a means for me to show off this project. So the first thing that curve flow controls is called the grab skill, which tracks how well you're able to use this grab move to get projectiles out of the air. Once you do this, you're able to either throw them back or consume them to regain your mana. As you start to improve in this skill, the enemies in the game, all of the ranged ones will start to be faster and they more of a challenge for you. The dodge skill is how well you're able to dodge attacks using this dash move. Uh, you can also use it to get out of the way projectiles or just to move faster. And as you improve, the melee enemies will automatically start to move and attack faster towards you. So this is a list of everything that curve flow controls in FlowQuest. 
The main thing it does is that it builds the map procedurally as the game goes. It builds it on a tile-based system with each tile being selected separately from a query in the curve flow. Once all the tiles have been beaten, a boss fight begins, where first it will select the boss it thinks is best, and then it will build a custom set of minions where each minion takes into account the other ones that have already been selected. You get the best possible, like, four minions. There's a lot of information that goes into every single tile selected. This is what all of the tiles in the dungeon are going through each time one is selected. It may seem like that's a lot of information to parse, but in an extreme case, I was able to go generate almost 400 tiles in less than a 20th of a millisecond. 20th of a second with each individual tile taking less than a tenth of a millisecond, not including the time it took Unity to actually process all of this. Here are the graphs of two different players as they played through the game. Notice that player A has a much higher grab skill by the end, whereas player B has a higher dodge skill. Through this, it meant that their first boss fights looked completely different, with a different main boss and all of the minions being separate as well. I learned a lot from this whole process, honestly. On the curve flow side, I didn't plan well enough towards the start. There was a major feature I was working on that I later realized mathematically wouldn't help me, and I had to end up cutting it, losing a lot of code. I also wrote the documentation too early. Um, when I actually decided to merge the two projects together, I found some issues that I didn't notice in a debug environment, and I had to not only rewrite code, but also the documentation of how that code worked. And finally on this side, I learned to appreciate how other people make documentation. It's not really something you think about that often, but really looking into the gritty details behind it, it's a lot of work goes into it. On the flow quest side, if I'm ever working with an API again in the future, I'll be sure to implement it a lot earlier in the game's process. Because I ran into a lot of issues with how I was building the world by not doing it early. I actually never wrote a game design document for flow quest. I didn't think I'd need one for a project of this scale, but I was very wrong about that. Because there was a one small feature I overlooked in how the world was being built, I had to scrap over seven hours of enemy AI code just to fix it. And the last thing is I overabstracted too much. FlowQuest actually has support for unlocking new spells and leveling up your current ones. But with the current state of the game, none of those features go used. And if I put that time towards more visual aspects, it would have been better. Moving forward, I just want to polish up what I have left. CurveFlow currently lacks any debugging tools, and for another developer to use it, I need to implement those. And FlowQuest needs more content. The baseline works. If I just get more level spells and enemies, I think it could actually be a good game. Thank you. <laughs>